Review Editor of the Yale Law Journal. Dawn has, has spoken and written extensively about efforts to shift the ideolo ideology of the courts. And I, before I bring her up to say some very interesting things, I want to mention that she's also the author of, of a very interesting law review article entitled Ronald Reagan and the Rehnquist Court on Congressional Power, Presidential Influences on Constitutional Change. Um, that was published in uh, 2003 in the Indiana Law Journal. I recommend looking at it. I think it's something that's probably going to have a great deal of nexus with what she's going to talk about today. And with that, or maybe not, and with that, uh, Don Johnson. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for inviting me to be here today. And thanks to all of the other members of the ACS chapter here and to Chris Schrader um, for your involvement. Uh, with ACS. I am on the national board of ACS and also I'm the faculty advisor for the law school chapter at my law school in Bloomington, Indiana. And it's been a, a phenomenal experience for me being involved with ACS and I encourage all of you to join officially if you haven't yet and take part in, in the activities here. Also think about whether you can make it to the annual convention that takes place every summer in Washington, D.C. We had over a thousand people there last summer, and it was a tremendously inspiring uh, event. Great to be with, um, with that group of people and, and high quality speakers and panels, and something I think many of you would enjoy. You are all very lucky to be here at Duke Law School. Uh, I love coming back here uh, to, to visit, have friends on the faculty, and um, envy you all for, for the people you get to to study with, Chris Schrader, uh, Jeff Powell, who I see back in the corner back there, um, your wonderful dean. I won't start mentioning all the great people in your faculty, but you really are, are very fortunate here. And thank you again for having me. My subject for today is one that's very familiar uh, to, I think, all of you, it's fair to say. It's the current very public, very divisive, um, and very important controversy over what are the appropriate standards for selecting federal judges. Uh, and we have with us here, as I said, Chris and Jeff, who are, I think, experts on this issue. So I hope when we get to the question and answers that we can have a conversation. And I urge all of you to, to take part in expressing your views, because it really is a subject on which we all can and should contribute. Theoretically at issue are the appropriate standards, uh, selection standards for both the President and the Senate. But as I've heard Chris Schrader in particular uh, effectively explain, the President makes his selections in relative private, while the, Cong the Senate performs its confirmation role under the uh, pressure of far greater public scrutiny. And so the way this issue uh, and the current co controversy typically is framed really centers on whether senators should consider the legal views and judicial philosophies of President Bush's uh, nominees. And that's what, what I'm going to focus on today. Can everyone hear me OK? Is the sound good? All right. So I'd like to say up front that the way this issue typically is discussed and debated, frankly, drives me crazy. Um, People talk past each other. They say things they can't possibly believe. People who are saying precisely the same things but using different words claim to disagree and even viciously attack each other. So I am going to open with a suggestion for how I think we might be able to inject some sanity uh, and maybe end the insanity uh, in this debate, and I, I think it's entirely appropriate that I unveil this idea here at Duke Law School. What I think the country needs to do is uh, recognize the wisdom of Professor Jeff Powell. And I want to note that I think we could accomplish the same objective by recognizing the wisdom of Chris Schrader, but I've chosen in this talk to pick on Jeff. What I have in mind in particular is this wonderful book, A Community Built on Words, The Constitution and History and Politics. I won't embarrass you by asking how many people have read this book, but I do urge you all to read it. It's wonderful. 
I love this book. It um, contains, uh, it's full of valuable and fascinating stories from our constitutional history, and they're stories of great relevance today to the important issues we face today. Toward the book's end, Jeff sets forth what he describes as 20 shared constitutional first principles. Um, and, and Jeff says these principles are beyond serious challenge. And they're principles that he aptly describes as what, just exactly what I think our country needs today. And I'll quote, the common ground on which present day constitutionalists stand as we come to rhetorical blows over the hotly disputed issues of our day. I want to read the 11th principle in its entirety. And this is what I have in mind when I say the country should recognize his wisdom, in particular on this particular debate. The judiciary is not infallible. Therefore, the people and the political branches of the federal government ought to take appropriate steps to change the constitutional views of the judiciary when they believe the courts have erred through constitutional amendment, litigation, and the appointment process. The most formal means of correcting perceived judicial error, the amendment process created by Article 5, is also the most cumbersome. And I believe that our history legitimates efforts to persuade the courts to change their views on constitutional matters through the litigation process and by appointing, as opportunity arises, judges likely to take a different position. The use of the appointments process for this purpose raises some hard questions in application, but despite the occasional protest by those substantively opposed to whatever change is sought, the principle is settled. Now at this point, I have to confess that I wrote an article in which I, several years ago in which I said, Jeff might be slightly off on just this one principle. I agreed that this 11th principle um, ought to be shared uh, and beyond dispute. But in light of the intense public controversy, I thought it seemed just a bit premature, perhaps a bit overstated, to say that this principle is beyond serious dispute. Indeed, most of the Republican Party, the president, the Republican leadership in the Congress, all seem to dispute it. So how could a controversy that was so hot that it evokes threats of a nuclear option in fact, mask a settled constitutional first principle. I realize now I should have known better than to so quickly disagree with Jeff, because uh, especially on a question of constitutional law, because, and especially in writing, because now I think Jeff is right, and that his is the best way, the better way, to understand what is going on in this debate over judicial selection standards. The disagreement is not genuinely over substance. It's almost entirely a political uh, partisan one, consensus does lie behind the rhetoric and the hypocrisy. Uh, a nominee's legal views and judicial philosophies clearly are relevant considerations for the Senate as well as for the president. Senator Chuck Schumer, who um, many of you know, has helped lead the fight in the Senate to establish this principle, helpfully elaborated in an op-ed in the New York Times in 2001, and I want to quote from that. How important should ideology be in the confirmation decision? The answer can vary depending on three factors. The extent to which the president himself makes his initial selections on the basis of a particular ideology. The composition of the courts at the time of the nomination, and the political climate of the day. Building on this op-ed and on Jeff's 11th principle, I recently published a short piece that urged that we try to uncover and foster consensus uh, by agreeing to some ground rules on how we talk about judicial selection. I realize that the politics and uh, the partisan incentives are strongly against me on this, uh, and I risk being viewed as politically naive, but I want to read to you the five rules that I propose, the five ground rules I propose we all adopt in how we talk about this issue. Get the little piece here. Ground rule one, one, take account of constitutional history and the criteria that presidents and senators have used over the last two centuries in selecting judges. These are designed to be non-controversial, relatively, though difficult to achieve. Two, avoid politically charged, undefined terms, such as political ideology, that obfuscate meaning and thwart productive debate. Three, do not pose false dichotomies, such as a choice between character on the one hand 
and judicial philosophy, legal views, or even less helpfully, ideology on the other. Four, the importance of judicial independence essential to the rule of law should not prevent relevant inquiries into legal views during judicial selection. Five, be consistent, candid, and nonpartisan in articulating the appropriate criteria for selecting judges. More bluntly stated, political expediency does not excuse hypocrisy or dishonesty. So in short, what we the people need to do is demand that um, there's an end to hypocrisy, demand people stop talking in misleading code and, and double speak, and instead say what they really mean. And one step I think that would help is to stop using the phrase ideology. And instead, um, and especially political ideology, to describe what's in controversy. And it's not because that's technically inaccurate, because it's not. It's because it's too easily manipulated and given misleading negative connotations. Ideology sounds like ideologue. And Democrats, in fact, use the phrase political ideologue to describe precisely the kind of nominee they believe to be unacceptable. So if instead we unpacked what we mean when we say ideology and explain with greater specificity what we're talking about, perhaps the right would have a greater difficulty in being dismissive and, and misleading, um, essentially because I think they really do uh, agree with us, uh, though it is not in their interest right now to admit it, now that they have political power. So what we should be saying is that senators, as much as presidents, have a right to consider how a nominee would fulfill the responsibilities of the position to which he or she has been nominated. What legal views that are directly relevant to the job of judging would that nominee bring to the position? It's probably clear uh, by this point that when I speak of um, hypocrisy and disingenu disingenuousness, that I have in mind primarily Republicans. So I need to emphasize that ACS is a nonpartisan organization and uh, acknowledge that I, of course, do not believe that only Republicans seek to persuade and mislead the American public through sound bites and code words. Uh, not all Republicans tailor their views uh, on the appropriate standards to whether the party happens to be in power at a particular point in time. And there are notable um, exceptions. Senator uh, Arlen Specter is, is one who uh, basically say the same things as, I uh, can't think of another right offhand, but as the Democrats about the relevance of nominees' legal views. Also, Republicans have dug up embarrassing quotes by Democrats in which the Democrats look like they're being inconsistent. But I do want to say on this issue, at this particular point in time, Republicans are the chief culprits, uh, and they have gone to an extreme that's deserving of our condemnation and that demands correction. Hypocrisy, I realize, is a, a serious charge, so I want to continue to make my case by asking you all to listen very carefully as I read two quotes. Uh, I'm going to quote to you two statements from two different sources, and I want you to think to yourself, who might be the source of these statements? And they're both about the, um, whether it is appropriate for senators to consider judicial nominees legal views, my topic. Okay, so here's the first quote. Who is it that criticized, lambasted senators who do consider nominees views and said the following? We have arrived at the point of selecting people to write a constitution rather than people to give us a fair meaning of one that has been democratically adopted. And when that happens, when the Senate interrogates nominees, you know, Judge so-and-so, do you think there is a right to this in the Constitution? We have rendered the Constitution useless. So many potential candidates might come to mind here. Um, Orrin Hatch, Bill Frist, John Cornyn, Tom DeLay, Carl Rove. So who's responsible for this particular charge? That Senate consideration of nominee's legal views uh, has rendered the Constitution useless? The correct answer, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia. Um, some of you might have heard about, or actually heard, as I was lucky to do, flipping through C-SPAN, a speech Justice Scalia gave last spring. Uh, it was an extraordinary speech that generated some controversy. Scalia spoke wistfully of the days when originalists uh, like him 
were confirmed easily and unanimously. Uh, here's the second quote, which I think responds very nicely to Justice Scalia, who said the following. There are few factors that are more critical to determining the course of the nation than the values and philosophies of the men and women who populate the third co-equal branch of the national government, the federal judiciary. So who made this statement urging that we do consider nominees, values, and philosophies? So you might think of uh, Chuck Schumer, Ted Kennedy, Dianne Feinstein, Jeff Powell, Chris Schrader. So the source of this second quote is President Ronald Reagan's Department of Justice in this document, prop here, the Constitution in the year 2000, Choices Ahead in Constitutional Interpretation. This was an official government report issued by Reagan's Department of Just Justice under the direction of his Attorney General Ed Meese. And this, of course, is the same President Reagan who uh, appointed Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, in part because of his legal views. President Reagan and Attorney General Meese uh, developed a comprehensive, detailed vision of how they thought the Constitution should be interpreted. And they laid out the substance of this agenda in this 199-page report and several others like it during the mid-1980s. The agenda they called for, um, the, their agenda called for radical constitutional change, uh, and they chose a point in time in this particular document a dozen years out as their focus. What did they want constitutional law to look like in the year 2000? Now, I'm going to return to the substance of their agenda in just a moment, but first I want to emphasize that this particular document, the Constitution in 2000, also address the strategy they would use to implement this agenda. The quote I just read from uh, is worth repeating. There are few factors more critical to determining the course of a nation than the values and philosophies of the men and women who populate the federal judiciary. That's in the introduction. The introduction then goes on to say, it is hoped that this report will allow members of Congress, of both parties, pursuant to their constitutional responsibilities, to assess judicial nominees in the most thorough and informed manner possible. So that's Ronald Reagan and Ed Meese's Department of Justice. So reading these words reminds me of something Sandy Levinson wrote about Ed Meese back in 1987. Attorney General Meese can be a source of insight, just as a stopped clock is right twice a day. Professor Levinson was talking about um, a very controversial speech that Meese gave in 1986. Uh, Meese argued that Reagan legitimately could disagree with the Supreme Court and adopt positions at odds with the court. We know now that while Meese was out making these speeches in favor of uh, presidential independence and constitutional interpretation, his Department of Justice was hard at work on this series of reports detailing the radical constitutional vision that they wanted to implement. What is incredible is these official reports were largely unknown at the time, uh, largely unknown outside the, the executive branch. Meese actually made at least two good points. First, the views and philosophies of judges uh, do matter greatly. Uh, Reagan proved this by appointing judges who continue to uh, today to reshape constitutional doctrine. Second, the Constitution is not simply what judges uh, say it is, and we can meaningfully distinguish between the Constitution and constitutional law. And all of us, uh, senators and students, uh, presidents and practitioners, academics and advocates, we all have a role to play in helping uh, participate in that debate of a constitutional meaning. To the extent that Meese and Reagan views were consistent with what I read uh, from Jeff's book, his 11th First Constitutional Principle, they were right. Um, now, where they went terribly wrong, in my opinion, is in the substantive constitutional vision um, they had of how uh, the Constitution should be interpreted. And in seeking to uh, both dramatically diminish constitutional protection for rights and also to deny Congress the power to protect rights, for example. They also went wrong in their profound arrogance, uh, in their utter lack of respect for Congress and uh, the Supreme Court, their coordinate branches of government. I had a 
I thought that I had a pretty good idea of what the Reagan administration was up to back at that point in time. I was working at liberal public interest organizations, um, uh, the ACLU and then uh, NARAL, now NARAL Pro-Choice America. But it wasn't until more than a decade later when I was, um, after I left those organizations and finished my time working at the Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, in the Clinton administration, and the Republicans were back in the White House and back in OLC, uh, that I came across this remarkable series of, of reports while I was doing research for an article. And I urge you to take a look at them yourself, especially the Constitution in the year 2000. And they're available on the ACS website. I'm going to describe a little bit of what they contain now, the substance of their agenda, but I cannot adequately convey just how breathtakingly, shockingly extreme uh, is the agenda that they promoted. And I think you can really just experience the kind of outrage that uh, is appropriate by, by taking a look at them yourselves. The reports detailed the ways in which the Reagan administration sought to dramatically change Supreme Court doctrine on all the great issues of the day, virtually all the great issues of their day. Con congressional power, federalism, racial equality, gender equality, abortion, affirmative action, access to courts, and of course their overarching originalism. Uh, their drive to limit constitutional meaning to the very specific expectations of the framers. So it is one thing to know, as we all did, that the Reagan administration uh, opposed Roe versus Wade. It's another to read in this second 153-page report, Guidelines on Constitutional Litigation, which directed all government litigators to seek the overruling uh, of the entire line of cases protecting the fundamental right to privacy. So it's not only Roe versus Wade, but also Griswold versus Connecticut, the right to use contraception, the right not to be forcibly sterilized, and Skinner versus Oklahoma. And to see in this document, list after list of Supreme Court decisions that the Supreme Court had, that the Reagan administration had targeted for overruling in the Supreme Court. So cases like Miranda versus Arizona, Sherbert versus Verner, United States versus Scrap, Faye versus Noya, Matthews versus Eldridge, Wickard versus Filburn, Katzenbach versus Morgan, Oregon versus Mitchell, City of Rome versus United States, Thula versus Kletznik, Island Trees versus Pico. That's an amazing list, and, and that's not all of them. All on you know, uh, Supreme Court decisions inconsistent with uh, the Reagan view. Other reports in the series that I didn't haul with me here today include original meaning jurisprudence, redefining discrimination, wrong turns on the road to judicial activism, a reconsideration of the broad equitable powers of the federal courts, religious liberty under the free exercise clause, all official reports of the, the US government, the Department of Justice. Think for a moment about how extraordinary it is these reports were not widely known and debated at that time, uh, including in the context of ongoing judicial uh, confirmation hearings going on during the Reagan and Bush years. And think about how those hearings might have been different if uh, the senators had, in the Reagan administration's own words, this commitment to choosing judges who would overrule that long list of precedent. Especially this report, the Constitution in 2000, that expressly called upon senators of both political parties to um, assess nominees in the most thorough and informed manner possible. Um, so I urge you just to at least skim the table of contents in this, in this book. There are 15 chapters. And just looking at the table of contents gives you a sense of how um, the issues that the Reagan administration is arguing are relevant to judicial selection and the degree of detail that they believe the nominees should should be scrutinized. Um, things like, you know, they put um, right to privacy in quotes, derogatory quotes, and then talk about, um, in a very different way, another unenumerated right. Will the freedom of association protected by the First Amendment, no quotes around that, provide any significant protection against the application of government policies to private groups and organizations? Um, so I'm not going to read through them all now, but urge you to do that. What's the current status of the reagan Meese effort to remake the law? So far, uh, very mixed. Uh, it's a work in progress that is carried on now by the judges Reagan appointed and 
uh, by, by um, President Bush. And it's really premature for a final evaluation. But the Reagan administration set for itself the year 2000 as a marker in one of these books, the Constitution in the year 2000. And coincidentally, that very same year, Ed Meese was interviewed by Greenbag, and he was asked what he viewed as the Reagan administration's greatest legal successes and failures. Meese cited as a great success changes in, quote, the allocation of power and authority between the national government on the one hand and the states on the other, close quote. So um, federalism, congressional power. He certainly is correct about that, given the Rehnquist Court's changes of the last decade, limiting Congress's commerce power and Section 5 authority, expanding um, state uh, sovereign immunity, state protection from so-called commandeering. Most of us who went to law school before these um, documents were written, or while they were being written, never imagined then that the court would adopt these changes. The doctrine uh, certainly was easier to learn back then, when we didn't have to learn about congruence and proportionality tests and, and uh, all of these, these uh, new um, incomprehensible standards. But others did imagine these changes in these very documents, in dissents, in law review articles. They were intentionally promoted by the Reagan administration uh, and then by uh, the Bush administration and the judges they appointed. And today, some of these are the holdings of the United States Supreme Court. So Meese cited, uh, in addition to federalism, he also cited as a victory progress they had made toward rendering unconstitutional any government use of race to benefit uh, racial minorities. Now, that, of course, was before their recent loss in the Michigan Law School case, where the court held that affirmative action plans can survive strict scrutiny, at least in some limited circumstances. Mises' selection for their most disappointing loss, anyone have a guess? The failure to persuade the court to date to overrule Roe versus Wade. So many of us did breathe sighs of great relief when the court 5-4, uh, by narrow 5-4 margin, rejected the rights positions in Planned Parenthood versus Casey and uh, Grutter versus uh, Bollinger. Even these conservative failures, though, uh, succeeded in substantially diminishing rights and distorting legal doctrine, uh, and also importantly, in ways that leave open the possibility of far greater harm from a court without Justice O'Connor to provide that fifth crucial vote. So we now have a malleable undue burden standard rather than the strict scrutiny that the Roe court applied to what they deemed a fundamental right. We also have strict scrutiny and heavy skepticism of any government consideration of race to benefit racial minorities, to promote racial diversity and remedy societal discrimination. Okay, so what does all this have to do with our current president, George W. Bush, and uh, Senate scrutiny of his nominees, including Sam Alito? Perhaps President Bush sincerely disagrees with Ronald Reagan, Ed Meese, Jeff Powell, about the clear relevance of nominees' views. For example, back a couple months ago when he nominated John Roberts, perhaps he seriously considered choosing instead, say, Walter Dellinger, another prominent, brilliant Supreme Court advocate, constitutional law expert, an individual of impeccable character. Walter also had similar uh, executive branch experience as John Roberts, though in positions of even greater authority as Solicitor General and Head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Parallels continue. Walter's an incredibly nice guy. Uh, he's a consensus builder, someone virtually everyone can get along with, make a great Chief Justice, just as some describe John Roberts. So perhaps in the end, President Bush simply flipped a coin. Heads Dellinger, tails Roberts. So this, of course, is ludicrous. Nobody, virtually, virtually nobody, I should never say nobody, nobody, virtually nobody believes that President Bush chose John Roberts and then Harriet Myers and then Sam Alito based solely on character, intellect, and experience without any regard for their legal views. And most important, President Bush told us otherwise. He told us even before we elected him 
for the first time. He promised us future Supreme Court nominees in the mold of Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas. What more did we need to know? To the extent that judicial activism is a useful term, I'll leave that to you, Scalia and Thomas are far more activist members of the court than the so-called liberals and moderates. And this is true whether we judge activism by their willingness to invalidate acts of Congress or overrule Supreme Court precedent. Uh, for example, People of the American Way did a study that found that Scalia and Thomas would like to overrule over 100 Supreme Court opinions, including many of the opinions targeted in the Reagan-Meese reports. Of course, some precedents should be overruled. Some statutes are unconstitutional. The court should strike them down. The, the question is, which laws, which precedents, and why? Um, and on that, Scalia and Thomas unquestionably are on the far extreme right of the court. Um, even beyond Bush's campaign promises, he and his administration repeatedly have confirmed his actual consideration of nominees' views, often, though, in code, saying as little as they possibly could so they could reassure the radical right, but at the same time not risk frightening the American mainstream. Now here's where I wish I had a couple of TV screens behind me so that I could show news clips and let people skewer themselves with their own words. Um, the way Jon Stewart does, you know, in The Daily Show, going back and forth. Um, actually, I wish we actually had Jon Stewart here himself because even if I had the screens, I couldn't do what Jon Stewart does. But if he were here and had the screens, what he would do is, at this point, show President George Bush and his press secretary, Scott McClellan, saying over and over and over and over again, um, and this is especially when they were trying to salvage Harriet Myers, she's a strict constructionist, strict constructionist, strict con constructionist. She has a conservative judicial philosophy, judicial philosophy. She won't legislate from the bench. She will strictly interpret, not make law. If you look at the, the press conferences, those same three or four phrases over and over and over and over. The whole fiasco over Harriet Myers, I think, is further clear evidence of the hypocrisy, uh, with George Bush going to great lengths to reassure the right, uh, weighing that he knew Harriet Myers, he knew she was with them, he knew it was in her heart, he knew she wouldn't change. Um, when that didn't work, then he nominated Sam Alito, who was, uh, of course, the darling of the right and, and on their short list all along. Now, I want you to contrast this with uh, the, um, this express consideration of legal views by, by President Bush with how just two short months ago, Republican senators repeatedly urged John Roberts not to answer questions during his confirmation hearing. How many of you spent some time watching those confirmation hearings and got a sense of that? Okay, you didn't have to watch very much, I think, to get, to, to get a sense of that. It was so repetitive and boring after a while, I found it painful to, to keep watching it. Here's just one example. When Biden, Senator Biden, complained about Robert's repeated refusal to answer his questions, Senator Hatch turned to Roberts and he said, go ahead, go ahead and continue not to answer. So even worse, even worse than refusing to answer questions, Roberts and several senators actually suggested that Roberts might cross an ethical line if he did answer, uh, if he was more responsive and forthcoming about his legal views, thereby implicitly uh, condemning any nominee, past or future, who is more responsive. And partisanship taken to this extreme, uh, it's more than simply hi hypocritical, it's, it's dangerous, uh, and it's indefensible, and it's outrageous. Uh, I have one more quote for you. On these points of inconsistency uh, and also relevant to ju judicial ethics, I want to quote Justice Scalia a second time. In the 2002 case, Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. How many people are familiar with that case? I don't think it's a very familiar case. Um, in that case, uh, the court struck down a Minnesota canon of judicial conduct that prohibited someone who's running for judicial office from announcing his or her views on disputed legal issues or political issues. Uh, under this canon, it would be unethical, for example, for a candidate to declare whether he thought he or she thought Roe versus Wade should be overruled or affirmed, reaffirmed. 
So Justice Scalia wrote for the court uh, that this was unconstitutional. He wrote that this prohibition reached speech at the core of our First Amendment freedoms, speech about the qualifications of candidates for public office. Uh, Minnesota had argued that the canon promoted judicial impartiality. Scalia responded by saying impartiality meant only a lack of bias for or against either party to the proceeding. Um, he said an impartial judge was not one without a particular opinion that predisposes him to vote a particular way in a case. And I want to read just a little more from Scalia's opinion for the majority. When a case arises that turns on a legal issue on which the judge as a candidate had taken a particular stand, the party taking the opposite stand is likely to lose, but not because of any bias against that party or favoritism toward the other party. Any party taking that position is just as likely to lose. The judge is applying the law as he sees it even-handedly. Proof that a justice's mind at the time he joined the court was a complete tabula rosa in the area of constitutional adjudication would be evidence of lack of qualification, not lack of bias. So here we have Justice Scalia writing for the Supreme Court, explaining, of course, judges decide cases based on their pre-existing legal and political views. And candidates could not, consistent with the First Amendment, be prohibited from expressing those views as they campaigned for elected judicial office. No ethical conflict or appearance of impartiality resulted from expressing such views before becoming a judge. Remember, this is the same Justice Scalia I quoted earlier who criticized senators said they rendered the Constitution useless for questioning judicial nominees about their legal views. So I'm going to finish up now with just a few ob observations about our present uh, nominee, Sam Alito. And I know you're going to have an event, is it tomorrow, looking more closely at Alito's record, so I won't, won't say very much about that. But one question that I've received from several sources, including reporters, is uh, how, and these are people who are familiar with uh, in a couple articles that I wrote on this subject, is how do we know if Alito, if confirmed, would actually pursue, promote the reagan meese vision and be like Scalia and Thomas? So um, first, remember how he was cho how uh, Alito was chosen, how the right reacted. Myers withdrew under intense pressure from the right, who viewed her as not sufficiently reliably like Scalia and Thomas. Uh, when the right when, uh, when President Bush nominated Scalia, the right celebrated with several of them. I heard several of them, people, leaders uh, from right-wing organizations, describe his nomination as a grand slam. You probably heard the same thing. I'm someone who actually hates sports analogies because I often don't understand them. But I had no problem completely understanding what a grand slam meant in this context. Uh, second. Alito, like Roberts, actually was part of the Reagan administration. Many of you might remember that Roberts, during his confirmation hearings, he argued that he didn't necessarily agree with anything, any legal positions the Reagan administration took. Um, he didn't necessarily agree with anything he said or wrote when he was part of the Reagan administration because he was just acting like a lawyer. He was representing his client's interests. Um, completely unpersuasive. I remember Walter Dellinger writing a, a good op-ed on that point. But as unpersuasive as that was, Alito cannot even make that argument. So how many of you have been following the stories about Sam Alito's application for a job at the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel? Everyone aware of that? Last week, one of the reporters who called me asked me whether I had any direct evidence that Alito adhered to the reagan Meese agenda. I actually said, you know, I don't have any smoking gun-like evidence to cite you, and I didn't expect that we would find any. But I think now we do have a smoking gun, and you're generally all familiar with it, but I want to just read a couple sentences here in Alito's own words. I am and always have been a conservative and an adherent to the same philosophical views that I believe are central to this administration. That's the Reagan administration. Then he lists long list of specific issues. The administration has already made major strides toward reversing the, this trend through its judicial appointments. And it is my hope that even greater advances can be achieved during the second term, especially with Attorney General Meese. 
at the leadership of the Department of Justice. Uh, more recently as a judge, um, actually before I get to that, let me just say, I focused in talking about the extent to which the reagan Mises agenda already has been achieved, I focused on Ed Mises' uh, uh, response about the greatest legal successes and failures. Let's just think about those same issues with, with Judge um, Alito. Um, as I mentioned, these are all issues on which the Rehnquist Court has moved part of the way toward the reagan Mises positions, but stopped well short of, of achieving it, short of overruling cases like Roe versus Wade and Wickard. Um, so these are federalism, congressional power, abortion, affirmative action. So um, in this document, in this job application, and you probably have read this in the press reports, he lists, of course, federalism and uh, limited government as the first items in his litany of positions with which he agrees with the Reagan administration. And then he writes, most recently it has been an honor. Uh, let's give it. I am particularly proud of my contributions in recent cases in which the government has argued in the Supreme Court that racial and ethnic quotas should not be allowed and that the Constitution does not protect a right to an abortion. So those are Sam Alito's own words applying for, for a job in the reagan Meese Justice Department as a, as a judge. Uh, whenever uh, the Rancos Court has given him an opening on these particular issues, Alito has taken it farther than the Rancos Court itself ultimately was willing to go. Uh, looking just at the Republican appointees, um, he's gone farther, farther than O'Connor, Kennedy, Rehnquist, and even Scalia on some of these issues. I haven't seen one where he's gone farther than Justice Thomas. So he might be, he might, he might not be to the, the right of Justice Thomas in any issue. I don't, I haven't found one at least. And then as a lower court judge, so far Alito um, didn't have the authority, of course, to overrule Roe or, or Wickard as he would on the Supreme Court, but his willingness to go as far as he did on all of these issues, uh, as far as was necessary to achieve. Um, these results, I think, is telling about what he would do on the Supreme Court. Uh, so I've covered, I think, most of the topics. The only thing I haven't talked about is a uh, super precedent in my title. And there I was going to say a few things about uh, the issue of abortion and, and what's at issue truly on, on that uh, right to privacy. What I want to just leave you with on that issue is this. There is more than one way to overrule Roe versus Wade. And we ask the wrong question when we focus on whether the court will expressly and completely overrule Roe. That could happen, probably not in the next couple of years, more down the road a bit. Uh, but the important question is whether, uh, Ali and whether Alito would apply the undue burden standard uh, in Casey the way O'Connor did to provide s at least some level of meaningful protection for women, for example, from laws that would require forced women to notify their husbands before having an abortion. And on that, we have our answer, because of course, Alito upheld the very same requirement. O'Connor uh, was the fifth vote to strike down, an essential fifth vote to strike down in, in the Casey decision. Uh, and on that, I just recommend uh, an excellent piece Will Salatan wrote in, on Slate, uh, which talks about how, in his opinion, Alito relied on the parental notification cases and likened women to children to, to uphold that requirement. So I'll, I'll end there with uh, one more plug for ACS and uh, thank you for, for having me here and now open it up for any questions or, or comments or discussion. Yes. I'm pretty uh, hypocritical about the whole taking ideology into account. Um, doesn't Justice Ginsburg confirmation kind of give a little bit of lie to that? That you had people like Senator Hatch saying, yeah, she's left, she worked for the ACLU, but she's qualified, so I'm going to vote for her anyway? Well, what I thought you were going to say, which I'll answer first, is um, you know, they had this whole thing about the Ginsburg standard, about how, they act how she didn't answer questions the way Roberts didn't, uh, which is a little different you know, than how people should vote ultimately. On the, the appropriateness of questions and demanding answers, I'd recommend to you uh, a report that is on the ACS website. And Senator Schumer did a, did a press conference that was on C-SPAN um, on this same issue of the Ginsburg standard. I think very effectively uh, rebuts the argument that she didn't answer questions. And she did provide far more, far more information than uh, John Roberts did. Now, I do think at the opening of the 
the hearings, I think it was Senator, Spe Senator Specter, Chris probably would remember, who said that nominees say as little as they need to to get confirmed. You know, that's typically what happens, and, and uh, that's not what he thinks should happen. I mean, he believes that nominees should be forthcoming. Uh, so I'm not saying that only um, Republican, nomin Republican nominees seek to avoid answering questions, but it's wrong. You know, I think what we need to do as a nation is talk in a principled way about what the appropriate standards are and then try to enforce that standard. Now, whether or not, how a senator should vote uh, when they're confronted with a nominee who doesn't share their views, you know, that's really up to each individual senator, uh, I think. You know, I don't think there's one right or wrong answer to that. And I do think Senator Schumer was right that uh, the impact, the real world impact on the court matters. You know, when you're talking about replacing Justice O'Connor, the justice in the middle, uh, I think that it is uh, more appropriate and important to consider that justice's, uh, that nominee's views on the issues in which Justice O'Connor cast the critical fifth vote on issues you as a senator think are essential to protecting the, the rights and liberties of uh, Americans and the, the correct balance of powers. You know, why would um, you pr pr willingly uh, give your support for someone who you think is going to destroy the, the nation, you know, on those issues? I don't think there's, there's any argument that that would be, um, uh, that it's inappropriate for a senator to, con to consider those things in deciding how to cast a vote. Yes? Um, I have a question. Do you think that if, uh, if the electorate elected, um, elected a president who uh, a priori made a statement that he would be, that he would act to encroach on individual rights, do you think it would be appropriate in that context to be electing the judges who would uh, basically uh, who would basically fulfill the wish of the people at this particular moment of time? Right. So that's President Bush's argument. I told people the kinds of people, I, the kind of judges I'd appoint, and, and that's what I'm doing. But and I've heard several senators say, I was elected too. And what I'm doing here is exercising uh, my power as a senator, my constitutional authority uh, conferred upon me uh, to um, confirm or, or not confirm uh, the President Bush's nominees. So the president's elected, but so are the, so are the senators. I think the double standard just doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, and this goes to the, the previous question, too, you know, how should a senator vote? I think Senator Schumer was right, too, when he said, you know, not only do you look at the composition of the court and what would happen to the court, you also look at what factors the president considered. And if the president is telling you, I'm doing this to overrule Roe versus Wade, you know, as Republican presidents have been trying to do for decades, then uh, in, in this whole, you know, list of of issues that they've laid out in great detail in these reagan Meese reports. And this is what we're trying to do, appoint justices who will adopt all these positions and overrule these hundred Supreme Court opinions. It's just insane to say, I think, you know, that the senators can't take that into account when they decide whether to confirm that president's nominee. Yes? Would it, would it be fair to say consistent with your views and your argument that Senator Orrin Hatch's approach to the nomination of Justice Ginsburg was incorrect, and that his approach towards the nomination is inconsistent with your approach towards looking at nominations? Actually, you know, I actually think, and I ask Chris what he thinks about this, I think Senator Hatch has been um, among the more principled Republicans. It's my impression that uh, you know, I don't know of quotes when they when he was out of power that contradict what he's saying now. I think he always has said that uh, 
we shouldn't consider ideology. Now, he, even he, though, says we should consider judicial philosophy. And we do want judges who are strict constructionists. So I don't think he's someone who's been uh, blatantly inconsistent, depending on who has political power in the way some other Republicans have been in, in their statements. Um, ultimately, you know, I do think judicial philosophy means uh, how a judge is likely to rule on, on uh, issues that would come before the court. Uh, you know, I think, as I said, okay, Senator Leahy voted for John Roberts. I think it's very unlikely he'll vote for Sam Alito. You know, so I think that these are, are complicated questions for each senator to assess based on their, what they value, um, and that it inevitably does, uh, for most of them, involve what the shift would do on the court and what um, they know about the nominee and what factors they know the president considered. Yes? I'm sorry if I'm asking you to express an opinion that you've really already expressed, but <clears throat> I, I certainly see the argument that because the president uh, you know, considers legal ideology in his decisions and, and because it's private, that certainly the Senate of the confirmation process should, should be able to do the same. Um, but also considering the fact that, and so if both the executive and the Senate were all allowed to just put their legal views and preferences out on the table, then it's a question of, you know, executive nominates who he wants, and if it's a Republican-controlled Senate, well, then it goes through. If it's a Democratically-controlled Senate, it doesn't. If it's uh, a mix between the executive and it's who knows what. Um, that being the case, and also being the case that this is a lifetime appointment that will survive many administrations, is it better in general, and I hope you haven't already said this, what I'm saying is, sorry for the long question. I understand the argument that if the president can do it, everybody should be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But if it was a question of let's have it out on the table or not have it at all, if it was a question of you, no one, including the president, and he must be transparent about it, can use legal ideology in their decisions, or if, versus a rule where everybody can use legal ideology in their decisions and be explicit about it. Uh, which one of those would you support? If we could amend the Constitution and somehow, I mean, there's no such limit in the text. You know, it gives them the power to, to choose based on whatever criteria they like. And so I think uh, even if we could, you know, put that limit on their constitutional authority, it would be completely unenforceable, especially for the president. You know, for the reason that Chris, I think, first mentioned to me, you know, or highlighted that we're never going to be able to get inside the president's head, you know, in the way that we can force the senators in the hearings to, uh, we hear them asking questions of the nominee, so we have that insight into what they're considering. So there's that inherent imbalance, so it's just completely unenforceable. Even if we could, you know, even if we could, I think that in, um, that, that the role the court plays in especially today, but even at various points throughout our constitutional history, is such that, you know, going back to Jeff's 11th first constitutional principle, that's entirely appropriate. And Jeff also, in what I read, acknowledges that there are some difficult questions of application and how much and how. You know, and that's right. You know, so I think absolutely the senators need to make clear they're not asking a nominee for a commitment for how they would rule in any particular case. You know, so they should say, as they do, uh, I'm not trying to get you to promise how you're going to rule in um, the AOT abortion case coming before the court this term. You know, that would be inappropriate. So um, there, are, there are limits and lines. But bottom line is, I think, it's inevitable that um, on some issues, at some points in our history, the uh, nominee's legal views will be considered, and the relevance grows as the role of the courts grow over time, and that's entirely um, appropriate and desirable. Other questions? I had to kind of push you on, on one point that you answered mm -hmm. back here. But you kind of said, you know, senators are elected too, and so they should be able to take this into consideration. Isn't that, though, kind of an argument that Sam Alito should be confirmed because 
at least 52 of the current Republican senators ran on confirming President Bush's nominees? Well, I think that you're making a good point that it's very likely they have the votes to confirm him. Uh, I don't think that means he should be confirmed. You know, I think um, that the people, uh, the process is ongoing. You know, and I think that the people have uh, an, uh, an obligation to be engaged and, and let their senators know how they want the senators to vote. Um, you know, think about the, the Robert Bork confirmation hearings, which uh, I don't know if, if many of you know much about, but they are, uh, I think, public, and Chris knows a lot more than I do, uh, but public involvement in that, <laughs> that constitutional debate you know, that was ongoing during those hearings the public involvement was, was very significant uh, and, and I think valuable and led to uh, some votes being changed. And the fact that uh, Justice Kennedy ultimately joined the court rather than Robert Bork made dramatic difference on, on some very significant issues. Yes. Um, I'm curious, I guess, about the political debate that's evidenced by all this discussion of procedure mm -hmm. in that, you know, <coughs> When we spend all this time discussing, you know, what questions can we ask Sam Alito, when we all know the question is going to be asked anyway. Um, the and not answered. Yeah, and, and not answered. The debate that we're not having is the debate that we did have with Robert Bork. You know, Kennedy got up and he said, I oppose Bork, and these, this is the list of things that Bork stands for that I disagree with them on, and Bork was questioned about what he believed, and we actually got an honest debate, and Bork was struck down because people decided, I don't like what this guy believed, and that was healthy. You know, by the time we got to Clarence Thomas, you know, we were discussing Anita Hill rather than the fact that he thinks that whites only lunch counters are protected by the Constitution. And by the time we got to, um, you know, and, and by the time we got to um, Sam Alito, now we can't discuss anything at all. So, so I guess my question is, you know, isn't the mere fact that we're having this conversation part of the problem? And how do we? You know, how do we re rejigger the political system so that we can have the conversation that we actually need to be having regarding any nominee? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, ultimately it's a matter of political power. And if, uh, as, as uh, Senator Specter said, if the nominee has the votes and can get away with saying very little, that's what they'll try to do. But so I guess, I, you know, I do think that there's some room, though, and part of it, you know, in one piece is reporters. Need to uh, need to press. You know, you read the transcripts of these White House press briefings, and they let them say twelve times in a row. They let McClellan say, "Strict constructionist." You know, should only consider um, uh, character and intellect and experience. And then next sentence, "Strict constructionist." Strict constructionist. And you need informed reporters to say, "Well, when you say strict constructionist." Doesn't that get into the individual's legal views? When you say this person's a strong conservative, you know, who won't change once on the court, how's that different than saying um, that you know the person's legal views on, you know, these top five issues of importance to conservatives is will be X, Y, Z? And so, you know, you don't you don't see I don't think that see that kind of follow up uh, on the part of, of reporters and more generally, you know, public public involvement and and also rec I think a lot of the arguments that the um, the right makes about you know should choose based on character intellect experience that's very superficially appealing you know that sounds great that sounds like merit and so I think educating people about what's really gone on in the past and and what really should be relevant has some potential for for being helpful any other Thoughts or questions? Yes. You mentioned um, you mentioned a suggestion that uh, perhaps we as a nation should uh, get together and decide what kind of uh, standards we should apply to the nominees. And um, uh, I was thinking whether you consider uh, the chance that that has already been done uh, effectively, but 
by what's going on. And it seems to me that your problem is that you don't see the desirable protection of minorities. Um, and the problem is that that the democratic uh, that the implementation of the of the democratic uh, uh, process in the United S States uh, 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 does not give sufficient uh, protection to minorities uh, because uh, basically a transient majority has the right to, uh, to do what it wants. Mm -hmm. and so you're saying that effectively we've already come up with an answer. And what is that answer with regard? I understand you. So your point is uh, when you're talking about the substance of protections we're electing people. Uh -huh. Trying, to, I I I was trying to suggest that maybe uh, that maybe the goal you are seeking should be uh, sh should be reached by effecting a, a structural change. You know. A, in the democratic process, rather than trying to change the standards of, yeah. of appointments, yeah, because you know, if you get if you get you know 70 percent of conservatives, they will change right. the norms back. Right. Yeah. So I guess I'd say you know two things. First, we have to deal with what we have now and. Um, I think that presidents and senators on the whole are considering the legal views and judicial philosophies and values of the nominees, and we need to be more uh, candid about that. And then second, uh, ultimately we do, I think, have to uh, elect different people if we want different substantive outcomes, and, and we need political change, ultimately. But we can't just sit around and wait till the next election. In the meantime, keep keep working, keep developing you know, those progressive views. We'll be ready to implement them when we have the political power and join ACS. So thank you.